From fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, real therapists. If you have any questions you'd like to ask or advice you'd like to give, come on over to podtherapy.net and join the conversation. We hope everyone enjoyed their Father's Day and Jim's Father's Day Spectacular. Yeah. Nick is back in the studio. I know you all miss me. <laughs> and now, broadcasting from Level 9 Studios, that guy is Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time for some pod therapy. I missed you, Nick. You did not. Uh, every Father's Day, that's what I do. Is I sit there sipping my coffee in the dark, wondering, where's Nick? Hope he's doing okay. <laughs> I doubt that. But thank you for the shout out. If uh, you missed it, there was a special little uh, kind of bite sized bonus episode where I read some excerpts from my book uh, called Love Dad. So go back and check it out if you feel nostalgic for Father's Day. It was very good. Did you have a good Father's Day? I did. It was a lot of fun. Um, I got sushi, and now my kid, uh, James, my my son, my my son James, he'll uh, he'll eat sushi now. He's only eight, so it's awesome. pretty exciting. So I finally have somebody to sushi with. Uh, and I, it took uh, twelve years to convince my wife to drink, uh, to try California rolls. So now she's <laughs> doing it too. So now my my life is steadily getting better. The more people I know that uh, enjoy sushi, so yeah, awesome. had sushi. So it's a big day for me. Sushi for Father's Day. Family Great. sushi time. So, But the baby doesn't eat sushi yet because she's too little. I don't trust giving raw salmon to a three-year-old. I just don't think that's a good choice. <laughs> I don't trust giving myself raw yeah, salmon. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. we had that experience once where I almost started choking. Oh, no. We were, oh, that's were, right. Yeah, yeah that's you were right. there. I think <laughs> I got – I have a video of that. Yeah. <laughs> <you do> that. <laughs> that's right. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. The chefs were running from out back. They're like, oh, is yeah. he okay? Is he okay? I was like, no, yeah. let, him, let him die. This is that's, how he wants to go. This is. I've read his will. This is what he wanted. <laughs> it probably is, actually, if I think about it. I suppose that's a good Choking way of saying Choking on sushi? Yeah. 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 I'll write that on your tombstone. All right. If, cool. if, I promise you this. I'll make a pact. If you die eating sushi every year on the anniversary of your death, I will show up at your grave, and I will just like like how people pour out a yeah. 40. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sit there and just pour out some soy sauce. <laughs> it's for you, buddy. <laughs> for the homies who ain't with us. No for the more. homies, yeah, that I've lost in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Sushi's not for bitches. <laughs> but I did have a nice Father's Day. Thanks Good. for asking. Excellent. Yeah, I did too. I moved, but – has nothing to do with my father. Yeah, I did. I did call. I was a good. I was a good son. I called as you're removing your TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Dad. I brought today. I can't talk. So, actually, ironically, we're talking about being parents, yes. and we have some big news that mm. uh, hit recently. Um, and we're going to try to stay relevant and current. And we've already failed um, <laughs> because since we even wrote this, stuff has changed. But I'm yeah. sure everybody knows. This is why we usually uh, stick to psychology and not current events. Yes, because okay. in the Trump universe, it changes by the minute. It does. <laughs> and and this is something again. We've said this before in the podcast that we're not political. We no. don't we don't try to become political. But stuff keeps falling in our laps. Yeah. And here's an example um, you know, why we want to talk about this. So obviously, unless you've – I'm going to talk to the people who have been living in a cave. Yeah, for the last, right. For last Tell them what's weeks. going on. So since early May, uh, 2,342 children – that number is probably already out of date – uh, have been separated from their parents after crossing the southern U.S. border, according to the Department of Homeland Security, as part of new immigration strategy by the Trump administration. Yeah. So actually, early this morning already, they've – um, it sounds like sounds Trump like wants to sign an executive order to to make that not happen. Right. Um, but there was a lot of politicking, right? Because at first yeah. he was like, no, I, I'm just enforcing I have no something. control. The, I, right. There's nothing I can do about the, this. The Congress and, wrote a law about this and Congress, both sides, kind of came out and said, uh, no, we didn't write that law. You're, you're choosing to interpret a law a certain way. Um, but what Nick and I are here to talk about is not so much uh, the politicking of how things happen or what laws say, but let's talk about the psychology of these children, right? Because the yes. children are being separated from their families. And that's the thing that has bothered me um, w watching this is I, I think, first of all, I, I have a lot of uh, family members, friends that share or have opposite political beliefs as I do. Mm -hmm. And for everything, I understand why. I may not agree with it, but I understand where they're coming from. For mm -hmm. the most part, they're usually coming from, you know, the right place. Mm -hmm. um, we just disagree on how things should happen. This, I do not understand the other end of this argument. It makes no sense to me, and I've not heard a logical reason why we would do this. And the big thing that upsets me is, and, and where you and I can contribute to this conversation, is the psychological effect that this has. Mm -hmm. On a developing brain, yeah, on yeah. children. This there's 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 going to be there's damaging, irreversible psychological consequences 
to separating children from their parents. Yeah. And when this is done, it is intentionally inflicting trauma. Yeah, that's not an accident. Exactly. Yeah. And even, you know, you're a therapist, I'm a therapist, we've, you're a father, I've worked as a therapist in foster care. Yeah. I have been a foster parent. And so I, I have experience working with kids who have been separated from their parents. Yeah. And that decision is never made lightly. Mm-hmm. When uh, DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services, if they have to intervene and if they have to remove a child, that is a last resort. Yeah. They have to basically make the determination that staying with the parent is doing more damage than removing them from the parent. But the child is the thing they're thinking about. Absolutely. When they're assessing damage. And that's, yes. I think, what's unusual about this. And this is actually a good moment to, to help the person in the cave understand what we're talking about. Again, these these families are crossing the border illegally. They do not have documentation. And they're bringing young children. And they're doing that probably because they would like to uh, have those kids have a better life than what's available where they're from. But when they get here, when they get caught, the new policy currently is that they've been separating the children from their families. So here's here's a um, a quote from the uh, Associated Press, a story that came out from somebody who was there. They the uh, administration created what are called tender age camps for very young children. And um, this is what was written by somebody who observed it. The youngest child separated from parents at the border is eight months old. The average age of children in the organization's care dropped from 14 to 7 years old in recent weeks after the new zero-tolerance policy was adopted. The youngest children are shell-shocked, crying themselves to sleep. Then they wake up from their naps, and again they're crying for their mom. Asking where their parents are, they absolutely need their parents right now. So it's a pretty serious thing. Yeah, uh, that is incredibly tragic. And even I think it's it's great. I mean, it's it's uh, showing that he's a human that he is now going to reverse this. Yeah. But here's the thing: that doesn't make it okay. No. The other defense that I keep hearing is the fact that oh, it's like a summer camp. These kids, you know, they're they they go there and you know they've got video games and they've got classes and they do things and it's fun. No, it's not. It. I've been to summer camp. (laughs) I'm a scout. I've been to lots of camps. But when I went, my parents weren't afraid that they'd never see me again. Right. I was never afraid I'd never see my parents again. It's a much different situation. And it doesn't matter how comfortable you make that situation. The psychological damage that you are inflicting can't be undone. Yeah. That's the, that is the important message that needs to be sent. The other thing that really frustrated me about this was that, I can understand if there's some level of ignorance, like, well, you know, there's just, we haven't had a whole lot of research to tell us what the effects are of separating kids from their parents. That's, no one's making that argument because it's impossible to make that argument. We've been, we've known this since the fifties. Yeah. Studies have been done. Well, it's the and, reason we no longer have orphanages in America. Yeah. Like if you watch old Batman and stuff, it's like, oh, Batman, you know, goes to the orphanage or whatever. There's orphanages in, in all these old stories. They no longer exist because the separation of children from a family unit was discovered to be so devastatingly bad that it will follow them for the rest of their lives. You know, and this argument like it's summer camp, a three-year-old, an eight-month-old, they're right. not going to a summer camp. You know, their their only concept of safety, I was telling Nick this offline, it doesn't matter if you put these kids in the freaking Hilton. It doesn't matter. A child, there's perfectly well-adapted adults who were poor growing up. They lived in closets. If they had their family with them, then their concept of safety was being met. But I have a three-year-old little girl. She has known me every day of her entire life. If I try to pull her away from her mother when she's Mm -hmm. on her mother's hip or attached to her mother's leg, she will lose it. And that's Mm -hmm. a very authentic and honest reaction. She genuinely likes me. She tells me so every day. But even I, her other parent, Mm -hmm. cannot separate her from her mother without her experiencing crisis. How much more so some guy in a freaking uniform who takes the baby away and doesn't give her back. That is insane. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. Uh, Washington Post did a, a really good article, um, What Separation from Parents Does to Children, um, done by uh, William Wan of the Washington Post. And he interviews um, Charles Nelson, a pediatrics professor at Harvard. And 
for the average listener who may not know exactly what are the effects, uh, he goes into a lot of detail here and he kind of talks about some things that um, are really shocking. So as children grow older, um, they notice uh, following the children who have been separated from their parents, they notice there are differences in their brains. So those separated from their parents at young age have much, uh, much less white matter, mm -hmm. which is largely made up of fibers that transmit information uh, throughout the brain, yes. as well as much less gray matter, which contains the brain cells, uh, cell bodies that produce information and solve problems. Um, we're also aware that uh, later on in life, uh, the children who have been separated for them, from their parents in their first two years of life scored significantly lower on IQ tests later on in life. Their fight or flight response system appear permanently broken. Their uh, stressful situations that would usually prompt psychological responses in other people, such as increased heart rate, sweaty palms, would provoke no response in children. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is a big deal. It's you are permanent. Yeah, you are, there's there's no amount of therapy. That fixes this. Mm. So when something like this happens, this this is serious, and you're affecting someone who did not make the decision. And they're the most to try vulnerable to, to deal with it. You know, yeah. trauma is inherently devastating. We have fully equipped adult men soldiers coming back from battles where they have seen something devastating but separated from their friends who they only recently met in their entire lives. And that all by itself is devastating and irreparable and causes years of harm. When you are an infant, when you are a toddler, when you are a child, mm -hmm. this is the equivalent of murder. It's the equivalent of death. That's what this little brain has to interpret and then they have to feel unsafe. And so, you know, again, we're not being political about this, but it's very important that everybody understand childhood trauma is one of the most dangerous psychological conditions that can exist. And to inflict it knowingly on a vulnerable population is unconscionable. Right. And one of the other big arguments that I, I just want to jump in because it scientifically makes no sense whatsoever. And I feel like I, as a therapist, I want to weigh in on this, this threat or this idea that um, this somehow, if, if we just uh, let people in, it's going to contribute to all this gang violence. There's so much fear of people joining MS-13, right? But I want to point something out very important here. It, by doing this, we're working against that. And the reason why is there's this really good book. It's called Rec uh, Reclaiming Youth at Risk. Um, and one of the things that they look at is they look at this thing called the Native American Circle of Courage. Very similar to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Where in the Native American circle of courage, it's kind of like a, a quadrant. There's four quadrants. And the idea is, is that we have to meet needs in these areas. So one of them is mastery. So we have to feel like we're good at something. Um, another one is independence. Another one is generosity, feeling like we can give back. And the fourth one is belonging. We all have a need to belong. And in the book, they talk about how this need is met normally within a family and what happens when it can't be met within the family. If that need goes unmet, then that child never develops a sense of empathy, never develops any kind of connection of uh, emotions with other human beings. Or the other thing that happens is they will meet that need but in an unhealthy way. Mm. So if they don't feel like they belong within their family, where can they belong? In a gang. Right. Right? So by, by creating a, cir a circumstance in which we deprive them of meeting that need within their family, we are increasing the risk that later on this person who now we already know the psychological effects and they don't have any connection with human beings, where are they going to fulfill that need? Yeah, I think it comes back to that phrase, hurting people hurt people. And yes. so you're creating a generation of hurting people and you're devastating them. And they don't have to wonder who did this. It wasn't some masked man in the night who stole their family away. It was an administration. It was a republic. It was that flag. It was the people with that emblem. And that creates a devastating problem where these humans are vulnerable for the rest of their lives to join unhealthy relationships, create unhealthy things like terrorism does. So it does the exact same thing. The al-Qaeda's of the world are created uh, because we step on humans across seas. And